Um, so happy to give a um, happy to give the presentation without the video, but if you enable it at some point, just let me know. Um, great, thank you. Welcome to our part of this panel um, called Implementing Privacy Reviews and Digital Archival Collections. I'm Annie Schweikert, a digital archivist here at Stanford Libraries, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm here with Victor Aguilar. Hi, I'm Victor Aguilar. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, it says here I'm the Born Digital Preservation Lab Assistant. Uh, so that's interesting. <laughs> Victor has a number of different informal titles, but both of us work in the Born Digital Preservation Lab, which is one of three reformatting labs in Stanford Libraries. So in that capacity, we're responsible for technical preservation and access work in which high-risk data review plays a big part. So I think someone uh, will throw a link to our slides in the chat so you can follow along. I can add it later as well. Um, I just want to make sure we don't run over time. So I um, want to give people a chance to follow along um, at their own pace as well. Um, so next slide, please. OK, and next slide also. Thank you. Perfect. So I am sure many of you are familiar with the concept of high-risk data, but I just want to start with a definition so we're all on the same page. So at Stanford, in particular, data is classified as high risk when protection of the data is required by law or regulation, or um, also according to our university IT, um, data is high risk when a lack of confidentiality could have a, quote, significant adverse impact on our mission, safety, finances, or reputation. So it can get kind of broad. Um, some common examples of high risk data in our digital archival collections, uh, which we're working with, are scans of ID cards on hard drives, bank account numbers sent by email, social security numbers, which used to be on resumes much more frequently. Um, so we don't want to discourage collecting material that might contain this information. It's really common and it's, um, it's common throughout all of our materials as well. Um, and it's also not usually high risk forever, so it doesn't need to be restricted forever. Um, but it does have to be restricted for now. Uh, next slide, please. Our understanding of high risk data is informed by Stanford's University Privacy Office, which works with University IT to define and advise on privacy and data compliance. Um, their policies, which we follow, follow, include the requirement that high risk data must be stored in a highly secure location. Um, we review archival materials, I mean, first and foremost, for um, both legal and ethical reasons. We're striving to make our collections accessible to the public by making digital copies available online. But we also have to make sure that none of what we're making available violates expectations of privacy, uh, especially given that search functions make high-risk data easy to find in digital formats. Um, but in Stanford's case, specifically, reviewing materials for high-risk data is also a technical requirement. Um, the Stanford Digital Repository, which is where we store data for long-term preservation, is um, sort of an in-house creation, but it wasn't developed with high-risk data storage in mind. So because we're required to store high-risk data in a highly secure location, and because the Stanford Digital Repository doesn't technically meet those requirements, um, we store all of our born digital collections initially on a secure server managed by our library operations team. <clears throat> Once we've confirmed that materials don't hold high risk data, we can then ingest them into the SDR, from which they can be made more widely available to researchers and where they'll be preserved uh, for the long term with the rest of our data. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so this slide has a link out to um, our university IT's three tiers of risk classifications where you can learn more about what Stanford considers high risk data and um, requirements for that storage. Next slide, please. Okay, so our workflows for high-risk data review. Um, in the in-scope column, <clears throat> you can see that materials with plain text are prioritized, um, including web and email archives. Categories listed as out-of-scope are generally out-of-scope for technical reasons based on their tools. Um, they can be sampled on a case-by-case -case basis if the resources in that collection are considered particularly high-risk. Next slide, please. All right, so we're using Bulk Extractor and BitCurator to do our scanning work. Um, Bulk Extractor, as many of you know, scans a disk image or directory of files and extracts structured information such as phone numbers, email addresses, social security numbers, credit card numbers, keyword searches, um, based on which scanners you enable. Um, so we assign risk levels, high, moderate, or low, based on our assessment of the results. 
Um, I've got a sample bulk extractor command on this slide for your perusal. Uh, we can talk more about this in the flags and the Q&A if you're interested, but in the interest of time. Um, we're reviewing bulk extractor results first and foremost for high-risk data as it has implications for our storage policies. Um, we're also reviewing for moderate risk data to which we want to restrict access. Um, moderate risk data would be material that isn't high risk enough to require this secure storage, but which we don't want to make um, widely publicly available. So that would include um, things such as student contact information um, and other things to which we want to restrict access. So next slide, please. Okay, great. Sorry. Yes, I'm. I'm. I think this might be a slightly older version of my slides. I am so uh, sorry. So I actually, um, I think yes, we've covered bulk extractor functions. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go over it again. But I see someone's dropped a link in the chat as well. Thank you. So our current workflow. <clears throat> We start by working with curators and archivists to identify collections that require scanning. Um, and subject knowledge here is really valuable as it can point us to potential privacy issues. Uh, we then run a bulk extractor report, interpret its results, summarize our results in a report, and then record our work internally. Uh, once we're done, we discuss the results with curators and archivists. Um, and if we don't find any high-risk data, we can proceed with ingesting the content into the Stanford Digital Repository. If we do find high-risk data at the moment, the data stays on that managed secure server that I mentioned, and access to that server is mediated by Born Digital Preservation Lab and library operations staff. Next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Here's an example report summarizing what was scanned, um, whether high-risk data was found. Um, in the report, we add what actions were taken and details of the scan itself. We store this report in multiple places and record the scan as an archival event in our records. So on the right, you can see an example of um, report fields. Um, Victor ends up writing reports that include live links to the counts of um, objects with high-risk data that were found or objects with low-risk data that were found. Um, the report serves as a space to reflect on and write up the factors in our decision-making. Um, and in aggregate, they also serve as an illustration of how our workflows have evolved, um, which is really helpful to look back on. Next slide, please. Okay, so how did we... Um, develop this work. You know, I'm so sorry, would you go back just a couple of slides to um, the slide with about bulk extractor? That is perfect. Thank you so much for, um, for freestyling. <laughs> would you go forward one slide again, please? That's, oh, perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to give Victor also a chance to talk about um, bulk extractor, um, how he reviews results, and um, what how he adapts bulk extractor to work with his um work with his process uh right so bulk extractor is um the industry standard and possibly the best uh tool to scan a large volume quickly uh, it's certainly the main tool that i use in my work uh, but we found it's definitely not an off the shelf or a complete solution and it is instead uh, one tool that needs uh, some customization and uh, whose results need interpretation. Uh, so at this point, it's not yet possible to replace me with automation. Uh, one of the things that Bulk Extractor is great at is that it can see things we can't. So it can, for instance, see uh, into web archive files, which are rather difficult to look into otherwise. And uh, it does post a little context snippet of what it finds, uh, of the text around whatever it finds. Uh, so that can help to rule out a lot of uh, a lot of issues, but it still does require tons of reading to go through the results and uh, make sure that there's no privacy violations hiding in there. Uh, there are, it does come with a lot of flags and scans uh, whose documentation is not very obvious. Uh, many of them are geared to law enforcement and forensics, which is not quite uh, what we're looking for. Um, the other thing we found is that it's only as good as your word list or your regular expressions. Uh, so a lot of times we actually will run a scan, I'll start doing work, and we will find the need to actually 
build a new custom word list uh, that's a little more uh, indexed to the collection that I'm looking at. Um, we've also found that it misses a lot of things that it should be catching. Uh, so for instance, I found uh, looking at other things, I found telephone numbers that the that don't show up in the telephone number scan. Uh, the other uh, main issue that we have with it is that um, AV files or archive files can give uh, a lot of false positives. So I've ended up with uh, results that I put into a spreadsheet and have, you know, 50,000 rows. And then I filter out um, all the photograph files and I end up with like 150 rows. Um, so it definitely does require a lot of uh, filtering and uh, often custom collection and form for this, and there still is a ton of reading that is involved in going through the results. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Victor. Okay, could we um, advance the slides just a few back to um, how we develop these workflows and who guides this work? Perfect. Thank you. So the Born Digital Preservation Lab and Special Collections Archivists here at Stanford have um, identified review for high-risk data as a priority um, and have been working together over the past five or so years on documentation and workflows for review, which for um, quite a while we, as a group, executed on a case-by-case -case basis. So we tried to put these workflows in practice at scale in 2021, which included establishing a cross-departmental working group. Um, our work that year made clear the need for a dedicated staff person, and based on that 2021 work, we were able to hire Victor in early 2022 to focus on privacy review. Next slide, please. So in addition to the guidelines specified by both the law and by Stanford, we spend a lot of time considering archival context as we execute these workflows. In some cases, this context will make seemingly innocuous materials much more sensitive. <clears throat> For example, um, out of context, a list of names might not seem sensitive, but it of course can be sensitive information if it's a list created by say, a legal immigration aid provider or an AIDS activist group, um, both collections that we have. So bulk extractor is a weird entry point, point here. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's only surfacing um, pretty structured information for one thing and also only in snippets of context. Um, so it's us, up to us to account for more subtle or collection-wide context. Um, and in order to identify high-risk data with this context, um, we might change our search terms um, based on what we see. While we're, while we're reviewing results, we might manually sample more materials just to make sure we're not missing anything less structured that um, would qualify as higher moderate risk. Or um, at, in the end, sometimes you just have to pass the collection off to a processing archivist for another closer round of review. Um, Victor's in really deep with the data and he definitely sees things that make him want to rescan the collection, look closer for privacy violations, um, some of which can be really serious, but uh, we also don't want to step over this sort of murky line into archival processing. Um, we're trying to protect Victor's time, but that line can be much clearer in hindsight. Uh, our work is also guided by constant discussion. Um, I knew that we were going to encounter edge cases, but I had collected so many examples and regulations while we were working to define our initial workflows. Uh, I thought maybe uh, we... Maybe those edge cases that we would find would be easily resolvable with all the amazing examples that I had. Um, this was not true. We've ended up spending a ton of time with these you know, unique archival materials just defining what qualifies as a privacy violation. And we've been using those decisions to revise our approaches and workflows sometimes dramatically. So we've already gone through several sort of rounds of revision. And I just wanna emphasize that it's time consuming to feel like you're doing this responsibly. And of course, it's also consequential because responsible access to information is one of the core tenets of archival ethics. We don't want to over restrict information and sort of take the easy way out of just keeping all of our data unavailable to researchers. As the um, Digital Library Federation Born Digital Access Working Group, whose work I really love and have referenced a lot in this process, um, has put really succinctly, <clears throat> There's a serious tension between the potential to harm collection subjects and the potential to obfuscate history by restricting access unnecessarily. Next slide, please. Oop, sorry. 
<laughs> Apologies <laughs> again. Um, I think the slides just didn't get refreshed and I didn't remind anyone to, so that's partly on me. I apologize. Okay, yeah, maybe the next slide too. <laughs> And I'll just point out here, you can see, um, if we can go back to that slide, uh, so you can see um, uh, the back one more slide. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so you can see the top row there and the spreadsheet results shows um, what I call formatting artifact. That is what it looks like when it picks up something from a TIFF file format that it thinks is a privacy violation. And then you can see like sort of the context and the sort of surrounding text that in a lot of cases allows you to quickly rule something out, but it, in uh, many cases actually does require you to actually open the file and manually see what's there. Perfect. Thank you, Victor. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Um, oh, back one. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, Hiring a staff person who focuses specifically on this task has totally changed how we approach the work in a good way, for sure. Victor has a wide background of relevant work experience in particular, um, and he was able to apply it from the start. It's also just valuable to have someone who's really focused on this work. Um, Victor's clarifying questions and suggestions have been really um, a boon to our process. Um, he, his work has also helped us gather data on the scope of our backlog. Um, a very rough calculation based on his progress is that we have about 4.3 years of full-time work, um, which is a statistic that we hope will justify a higher level of staffing since he, he's currently half-time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so um, as Annie mentioned, I have worked many jobs. Um, while in some fields or jobs, this would be considered a negative. I feel it's been very beneficial here. I've primarily worked in uh, paramedical and paralegal areas uh, doing specialized data entry. I've also worked alongside um, uh, cybersecurity professionals. Uh, so I've worked with a lot of vulnerable populations and I also have a lot of experience applying uh, different privacy frameworks to information such as, um, you know, on the medical side, there's HIPAA. On the legal side, there is attorney-client privilege, uh, general confidentiality all of those sorts of things. Um, not to mention that having a broad a job background enables me to more quickly build familiarity with the context of uh, the various collections that I come across. Having said that, I definitely did come in with a bias towards personal privacy. Uh, so as our workflow has evolved, so has my uh, mindset to uh, come more in line with the tension that Annie was describing of uh, making sure that uh, we actually appropriately make information accessible to researchers. Okay, great. Next slide, please. So um, we've found that um, it's easy to get sucked into discussions of whether an individual bulk extractor result is high, medium, or low risk. Um, so we've been trying to take a step back and look at our workflows at a high level to make Victor's job easier and more efficient. Um, the privacy office at Stanford has advised us that the expectation is not that we're going to catch everything, but that we have a clear documented process in place. And so that's part of why um, you could see on um, one of the previous slides, we turn our bulk extractor results into a spreadsheet that we store on Google Drive, which has at Stanford been rated for high-risk data storage. Um, so that provides a um, a place for everyone to, who needs to, to be able to access documentation of our process and our, um, and our review. Um, we also towards that end have been trying to make our guidelines more generalizable. In some ways, this can mitigate bias by providing a uniform way to interpret results. And importantly, for the stated purposes of leaving a paper trail in our work, it's very standard. Uh, in other ways, of course, it can introduce bias by subjecting all collections to the same treatment, regardless of, important context, so we're still working on the right balance here. We also found that keeping our workflows too simple in some cases actually slowed us down. Uh, initially towards that end, we were reviewing materials just for the presence or absence of high-risk data. So now instead we classify bulk extractor results as high, low, or moderate risk. Um, the moderate risk category being materials that we want to restrict access to, but which don't have to be um, kept out of the um, Stanford Digital Repository. So this has made our work a lot easier because um, 
previously, we were engaged in a lot of discussions where we talk about materials that seemed like privacy violations, but maybe didn't technically fall into the category of high risk. We might have overclassified them as high risk in order to restrict them, but other materials that were sort of on the edge might get underclassified as low risk, even though there were reasonable privacy concerns. So the moderate risk category gives us another level of restriction to help sort of settle debates, and it also aligns us with the definitions used by the Stanford Privacy Office and University IT. Next slide, please. Uh, right, yes. Yeah. So um, as I stated, I did come in with a high bias towards uh, personal privacy. Um, so at first we were um, basically just checking the uh, bulk extracted results uh, as to whether they were true or false positives. Uh, and with my sensitivity, I was marking a lot of things as, you know, definitely having some concerns about privacy violations. So um, assigning different risk levels is actually not only more realistic, uh, but allowed, but allows those decisions to be properly placed uh, into the processing uh, that goes in into the work later on. Okay, great. Next slide, please. Uh, just two minutes, uh, two minute warning. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, many of our steps are, many of our next steps um, are aimed at refining our workflows and making them more efficient. Um, some other next steps include enlisting even more curators to help us really narrow down where high-risk data might be and where, what it might look like, so helping us with prioritization. Um, since the four-and-a-half-year backlog isn't going away without um, some collections getting tackled first, um, we also hope to enlist developer staff time to help come up with a longer-term solution to storing this data. Um, that's a note. People have been discussing and working on this for years. It's a very difficult issue, um, so, and we really appreciate the time that they've spent so far um, on tackling this. Um, whatever solution we come up with might itself totally change our workflows. And then we hope to one day offer training to other library units on this process. It's a perfect opportunity for archivists to integrate privacy reviews into their own processing procedures as it gets you in really deep with the data um, if, they're, if they're open to it. Um, next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, these, thank you to our fellow privacy working group members who are listed on this slide. Um, having a um, group of people within the libraries across a couple different departments has been really helpful to bounce um, ideas and needs off of. Next slide, please. Okay, great. And then um, we're really looking forward to hearing from the other panelists. If you have um, questions for us that don't get answered in the Q&A, these are our email addresses. And thank you for rolling with the um, with the slide problems. I hope that I I hope that um, hope that it came across just fine. Uh, and thank you so much to the hosts for all the driving. <laughs>